Uh, but it was awesome just to just to come together. You know, we're looking forward to today. We've been talking about um, Andy um, coming here, and his wife Hazel is with him from the UK, uh, from West Sussex area in the UK, which is, and he might explain this better than I will. It's kind of a southern east area, uh, down by the Brighton area, um, if you know England at all. Uh, but it's just awesome. We we first kindled a relationship back pre-COVID, right? And actually, Andy was going to be here a number of times, but COVID kind of wouldn't let him leave the state and or the in the nation and come over here. We wouldn't let him in, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but finally, finally, here we are, and it's a privilege uh, to have Andy and Hazel Robinson with us. Uh, they serve in our Christ Central churches around the globe in some very specific areas, which I'll probably share here this morning a little bit. Um, but it's just awesome just to build relationship and friendship with them and to see that growing and continuing. And it's awesome just that, that we um, this morning are going to have him share and speak with us. So without further ado, let's welcome Andy Robinson. Come on up. Bless you, bro. Thanks, man. Wow, this is really very, very special um, for me to be here. It's always a privilege to be asked to preach anywhere. Um, but when, when you're asked to preach kind of overseas and stuff, it, it really is uh, very special. So um, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to do my best to speak slowly. Um, uh, I've already been asked that already, that you know, maybe 80% of what I say you'll, you'll pick up. Um, because um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm from London, um, and so we speak slightly differently to the rest of the nation. I was, in fact, born just 10 miles from where the Queen was born, so she's a Londoner just like me, speaks just like me, went in private, but when she speaks to everybody else, she speaks very properly. But uh, uh, me, I'm, I'm just a, an ordinary guy from the east end of London, so I speak with this accent. We were out, actually, just in the last couple of days, and uh, our server asked Hazel where she was from, and she said, from England, and then, then she said, well, where are you from? And I'm from England as well. Oh, you talk very differently uh, to your wife. Well, as I say, it's because I'm a Londoner, so please um, excuse me for that. And before you ask, no, I don't know the Queen. <laughs> I just thought I'd put, that, I'd put that out there. As I say, we were born near each other, but I don't know her. Uh, and I guess you may well have the same question um, that Kim had yesterday. No, we don't all say cheerio. All right, just uh, just putting it out there. So uh, let me let me tell you a little bit uh, about us uh, and me. Um, I, I became a Christian when I was age twelve. My mum uh, led me to the Lord in our uh, in our home, and uh, my parents loved Jesus. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm very blessed to have great parents, and I do. I have a very special relationship uh, with my dad. Uh, me and my dad, we're just best pals. Um, we can talk for hours together, as Hazel will, will tell you, uh, about anything and everything and nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, he really is the best. Now, some of you might think you have a good relationship with your dad, but let me tell you, it's not as good as mine. You know, because my, my dad is the best dad in the world. Uh, and that's just a fact. So it's just the way it is. And uh, we've been through some tough things over the years, uh, many things that I've put him through, particularly in my teenage years. But, you know, we've always, we've always walked those things out together. And uh, he really, really is the best, the best dad in the world. So, Dad, if you're tuned in, it's all true, you know it. Now, Hazel and I um, were once introduced uh, at an event like this as a beautiful couple, which I was really pleased about. Um, until I realized that it was her that made it beautiful, and I just made it a couple. And uh, so, apparently I have the perfect face for radio, but um, it, it, it's been one of those things I have to learn, humility, because the truth is, as you, as you get to know Hazel, that you'll realize that she really is the brain's of the operation. Um, uh, she's a, a clinical prescribing pharmacist and works in our uh, local doctor's surgery in the town. Um, she's, a, she's a great evangelist and uh, she's had some 
amazing kind of stories you could tell you of people saved at work over the, over the years and uh, all that kind of good stuff. And she's, she's the second best preacher that we have at our church. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, she's great. We've got two sons, Tom, who is 28, uh, and he's the creative director um, of a YouTube channel called Game Theory, some guy called Matt Pat. Maybe someone knows who he is. I have no idea, but apparently they make enough money to pay other people. So don't even ask me how that even, even works. But it looks like they might well, him and his wife might well move to uh, the US, to North Carolina at some point. Um, he and his wife, Steffi. Steffi is uh, amazing. Uh, I've only got sons. So it's been a great addition to our family to have uh, daughters arrive. They're just brilliant. They cuddle better. They tell me that they love me more. It's like, it is awesome. So I just spoil them, spoil them all to death. She's also, Steffi, a great preacher um, at our church. And then there's my other son, Eddie, who's uh, 26. He's married to Chloe. And uh, they have a, uh, a little baby girl, our only grandchild at this point, called Autumn. And if you think I'm going gaga over daughter-in-laws, you want to see me when I'm with a two-year-old granddaughter. Hazel thinks I've lost the ability to say no. Um, it's, you know, everything is yes and amen <laughs> when it comes to me and, me and granddaughters. But, but uh, there we go. Until recently, I was the lead pastor um, of uh, a church called Life Spring, just 30 miles south of the UK. Don't worry, I've not been fired or or anything, anything like that. Um, I've been the senior pastor there for about 12 years, um, on staff for 15. But one of my passions is coming alongside young men and women uh, and raising them up as leaders and then letting them go do. Um, and one of the things that we don't often do very well is we like raising leaders and then we don't let them go do. Um, and sometimes letting them go do means getting out of the way. Um, and so I stepped out of the way uh, to let a guy who's 20 years my junior to come and lead, lead the team uh, and the church, uh, which is just wonderful. He's doing a great job. And in many situations, I think he does a better job than I would have done. Um, so it's, it's been great fun kind of seeing that. But I'm still on staff, still an elder at the church there. But they released me 50% of my time to serve uh, as part of the Christ Central Apostolic Team. Uh, and I know you had Jeremy and Roger here not so long ago, and they've asked me specifically just to send their love uh, and their regards um, to you. And uh, it's just a privilege to be part of the apostolic team with them. But doing what I do with them just meant I wasn't around enough uh, at local level to, to actually be able to lead the team and the church well, because half the time I'm not there. Um, I'm places like this. So, so that's kind of... Uh, uh, part of me in terms of local church. I also serve alongside Joseph Mawila, another one of the Christ Central uh, Apostles in Africa. So I work a lot in Zambia, Tanzania, um, and Kenya, um, which is a real privilege. And uh, recently we built a school um, there, and uh, it was just brilliant fun because we raised the money mostly from unbelievers which I just love. I mean, I'm, my background is business, so I, I love being able to kind of plunder Egypt for the kingdom. And uh, it, it's great to, to relieve them of their, of, of their money um, to come and do God's, God's work, which is just awesome fun. Um, so I've just started in the process of starting a not for a non-profit, as you would call it, a charity, as we would call it, to be able to funnel that money more effectively because sometimes I've discovered non-Christians don't like writing out a check when the name says something, 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 church on the end of it. So I thought, okay, I can fix that. We'll create a not-for-profit not without the word church in the title. Um, so we're calling it Waymaker because we're going to make a way where there is no way. Um, and they're going to do it even though they don't know that they're doing it. So um, that's going to be fun. So, and we're just about to build a, a medical center actually in, um, in, in Zambia because the WHO have just released a child vaccine against malaria, which is a game changer in Africa. And we want to be on the front foot ready to start administering that when it comes online. So, so if you've got a spare $50,000, I'm your man. I could really help you with that. Um, so do, do come and talk to me. 
Wonderful. Well, that's, that's us, and uh, we just enjoyed so much being here, enjoying looking around and being taken on, on, on trips. I'm not sh- quite sure whether I've been taken on trips in order that I will come back, or that, so I will never come back, because they, they took us out on some crazy boat ride yesterday in the sea, and we're doing this and this, and uh, so I'm just, I'm just waiting to see how that, how that pans out, but it's great, it really is great to to be with you. So thank you so much for uh, allowing me this privilege of speaking this morning. Um, and I want to I want to preach on something that God's really been stirring afresh in my heart again. Um, and I, I, I want to talk about how we engage with the Father heart of God. Um, and uh, it's a, something I'm really passionate about. Um, and the reality is, is so often, in, instead of actually behaving like sons and like daughters, we actually behave like what I would call spiritual orphans. And so I've entitled my talk this morning, if you're taking notes, um, The Father Heart of God, or The Heart of a Father. And let me just explain what I mean by a spiritual orphan. You see, because of Adam's sin, we were all separated from the Father by our sin, and we became spiritual orphans overnight. Our sonship was lost, our authority was given to the devil. And once removed from the Father's unconditional love, we struggle to truly love ourselves and love others. So when we move removed from the, the Father's love, we're also removed from his discipline. Because the Father disciplines those he loves. It's an act of love. And so, so when, we, when we step outside of that, we also step outside of his discipline. And because we are then spiritual orphans, we are what the Bible calls illegitimate. Hebrews 12 verse 8 says, If you are left without discipline, in which, all we have, in which we all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. And because we... Well, without discipline of a father, we're therefore unable to operate successfully with self-control because self-control is rooted in discipline. And quite often we we struggle with self-control, doing what we don't want to do instead of the thing that we do want to do because we've allowed ourselves to drift away from the love of a father. And so we therefore become slaves. Slaves are governed by fear. They're controlled by fear. Because the spirit of fear is actually the spirit of slavery. The spirit of slavery manifests itself in powerlessness. That sense of just feeling like I am unable to do anything about my circumstances to bring change. And so what we do is we accept our circumstances... Because we have no understanding that they can be any different. We feel power lost because we've got no one to turn to in time of need. We feel like we've got no protection in our time of trouble. And therefore, it's very easy for us in that context to then start to seek the devil's counterfeit, illegitimate alternatives. You know, we can, we can look for what we lack, this love and, and, and many things like it in, in relationships Especially girls can seek the love of a father in sex to kind of provide that closeness and that, that intimacy. They seek comfort from relationships. As do many of us. We look for that comfort, whether that comes from food or alcohol, different things. We turn to these counterfeit affections. Others look to escape into kind of fantasy, online gaming, drugs. Some even look to other religions, to meditation, to try and find this this peace that we lack. And all of these things deepen, actually, our slavery to sin and take you further away from that genuine, unconditional love of a good, good father. Romans 8, 15 to 17 says this, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, 
and as daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Amen. And Paul tells Timothy, doesn't he? He says, I'll remind you. That's always a clue. I'll remind you. Why? Because we forget. Okay, I'll remind you because you keep forgetting to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, of love, and self-control. Because self-control is rooted in discipline. And discipline comes from a father who loves us. And our temptation, even as believers, even though we are in Christ and he is in us, is to fall back into what I'm calling orphan thinking. We tend to behave like orphans, even though we are adopted as sons and daughters. And we have what I call kind of an identity crisis where we know who we are in theory, but we behave like something else in practice. See, an orphan doesn't feel at home anywhere. An orphan feels and behaves like everywhere is temporary. They don't want to put down roots or build deep relationships. An orphan is someone who's unable to really open up their hearts to receive love which actually results in you not being able to express love, even to your own family and friends sometimes. This is the opposite of what God has called us to be. If we're to be a people who are passionate about his presence, led by his presence, and known because of his presence, then we need to know who we are and whose we are. We need to know our identity as as sons and daughters. We need to know what that means to be adopted as sons and daughters and then behave like sons and daughters. Now you know that we we were in Adam because of Adam's sin, right? And that makes us spiritual orphans. But I want to tell you that you were in Christ before you were in Adam. Think about that. You were in Christ before you were in Adam. And I'll prove it to you. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says, For he chose us in him, in Christ Jesus, before the creation of the world. To be holy and blameless in his sight. So you were in Christ Jesus before Adam sinned. Okay. Okay. We got caught up, so oh my God, it's Adam's sin, I'm, I'm in Adam. Yeah, but you were in Christ before you were in Adam. So when Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, he redeemed you. Okay, what's redemption? Redemption means paying for something that is already yours in order to have it again. It's what redemption is. If you go and redeem something that you've taken to the pawn shop, it was yours. You lost it, you gave it away, and then you go back, and you pick it up, and you redeem what was already yours. So that's what Jesus did on the cross. He redeemed what was already his, because you were in Christ from the creation of the world. And because of Adam's sin and because of your sin, you were then in Adam. But then he came. And he paid the price that you couldn't pay because he'd lived the life you couldn't live. And he redeemed you again back to the Father. And so even before you'd messed up, before Adam messed up, you were in Christ. And that's why when you're redeemed, you can be his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. And if that's not amazing enough, in and of itself, I mean, maybe I should just sit down and we could just ponder that for the next half an hour. Because that is mind-blowing. 
if that wasn't enough, I want to just show you what a good, good, good father he is. Even if that wasn't enough, I want to show you what a good, good father he really is. And so we're going to look at a passage today, Luke 15. And obviously, I'll be reading from the the English standard version, brackets anglicized. Now that's an oxymoron where I come from, because it's the English standard version. So how it can be anglicized. Now a true story was I was in a bookshop and, and I saw an ESV Bible with a big sticker on it. And it said, now anglicized with a Z. What can I say? Shall we read it before I get too carried away? It's a, a passage I'm sure you'll all be very, very familiar with. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the young son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he'd spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, many versions say, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And he felt compassion and he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quickly, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and he came, as he came near to the house, he heard loud music and dancing and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But the son was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you gave me, didn't even give me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this brother was dead and is alive and was lost and is found. Now, I don't know what the heading is in your Bible for that passage. If you want to take a quick look. The heading. Some of it says the prodigal son, did I hear? Some says the lost son. Now, whilst all scripture is God-breathed, I want to tell you that does not extend to the, those paragraph headings. Okay? The verse divisions were added and the, the headings were added in 1557, well after the canon of Scripture closed. So you are okay to cross them out. And what I'd like you to do is cross that one out because this, this story is not about the sons. This story is not about the sons. This story is about Jesus' dad. And just like I was waxing lyrical about my own father earlier, this is Jesus saying, this is what my dad is like. This is what he's like. And so you probably need to scribble that out and just put, my dad is better than your dad. (laughs) 
This is all about him. Jesus is telling his followers, his disciples, and us about how his heavenly Father loves unconditionally. Even though his sons behaved like spiritual orphans, as many of us do. See, both of those sons behaved like they didn't actually have a father. And we're like both of those sons at different times. So let me paraphrase this story a little bit as we look at this parable, we see this younger son asking for his inheritance. Now, in that culture and at that time, that would have been the same as saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. That's how that would have been received in that culture. Dad, I wish you were dead. You know, now I've got two sons, and I can't imagine what it would be like if, if one or both of them came to me and said, Dad, just hurry up and die already. I've got things I need to do and I need the cash. Because what that's communicating to me is actually they're not in this for relationship. They're in this for what they can get out of it. And that's what was being communicated. But, but look how this amazingly dishonoring moment, look how the father responds. He, he didn't react to dishonor he had received, he, he didn't react in a way I think I would. You see, he, he took that dishonor and he released honor. So his son had come to him, dishonored him and said, give me your money. And what the father did was he released honor and he gave his son what he'd asked for. And more staggering to me, really, is the fact that if he'd have said no, no one else would have known. Just him and his son. But the fact that he said yes, the fact that he released honor when he'd received dishonor, meant that everybody knew. Everybody knew. And by saying yes, it actually increased his own shame. Because in order to honour his son, it, it meant that the whole community would know that his son had dishonoured him. And in a, in a culture back then, where what the community thought was so powerful, where shame was so huge, the father modelled something of honour for us. His response to dishonour was to honour. <laughs> What a father. What a father. And so this son, having shamed his father, he'd heaped shame on his father by requesting his inheritance early, continues to shame his father in squandering that inheritance that had been so graciously released to him. And we really must understand the full impact of that in this culture. It's quite something. The son was really going to town on releasing shame towards his father. And more than that, he was doing it publicly. Everybody knew what the son was doing. And some of us know what that feels like when maybe our children go off, don't follow the Lord in any way, shape or form or, or they make choices that you know, is contrary to what we would have chosen for them or, or the Bible teaches. We, we know that what that can feel like. But this father, this son was really, really going for it. But then, as we've read often, as is the case, hardship comes. The things that the son was looking for in taking the money and going away didn't come to fruition. You know, I'm sure that that son had high hopes for the future. This was my moment. I've got this wealth. I've got money. I can, I can do what I want. I'm sure he had high hopes for the future. But when he left, because he was orphan-hearted, 
He was looking for love and for intimacy and relationship and friendships in all the wrong places. And we read in the story that he eventually comes to his senses. He comes back to what I suggest is a very well-rehearsed speech. We read it, didn't we? It tells us what his speech was before he says it, and then when he gets there, he says it. And so it's like this rehearsed speech. Now, I wonder how many of us remember doing that as teenagers. You know, when you're walking home way after curfew, and in your mind, you're going through how you're going to wriggle out of this kind of when you, when you get home. How many husbands still do that? As they pull up to the driveway, having totally forgotten the thing that they were sent out to go and get. Just me? Okay. You see, we know that the son fully expected to be treated as a servant. I don't know if you picked that up. He expected dishonor because that is how he had behaved and how he had treated people. He couldn't expect anything else other than to be treated as a servant because he felt that's all he was worth. He put his worth, his value, if you like, in himself, in his performance. And because his performance had been so shameful, he expected to be treated as his sins deserved. But his father's response was very, very different. First, we see the father running to meet his son. Now, again, in that culture, for elders, I don't mean like church elders, but those elders, those, those senior people, and men in their culture, would never run. They would always just walk gracefully and People would just wait for them to arrive. But now this father, he runs, which was a shameful thing in their culture. And so now this this son who'd shamed his father, heaped shame on him. The father had honored and given him what he'd asked for. And now as this son comes back, full of his own shame, the father then puts aside his own shame. And it says that he raised, we see raised to run, because he had, he had like kind of a skirt on type thing in that culture. So he had to have raised that above his knees, shown his legs, again, shameful, and he would have run. And so this, this dishonorable son was coming, and the father, it says, ran. The father risked further dishonor in the community, in order to honor his returning son. And in the culture, as I've said, what other people think of you was so important. We see the father abandon his own honor, rejecting its shame in order to meet and love on his son. The father abandons his own honor in order to give honor. This is such a wonderful, wonderful picture because Remember this. You know, we read that story a lot, so we know the end of the story before we start the story. There's only that one time we don't know. But we know the end of the story. So you know what's going to happen. So when you read the bit that says, when, when the son was still far off, the father ran, you know why he's... Because you think, well, he's coming back. The story's just told us that. He said he's coming back. To apologize. We know that. The father didn't know that. For all the father knew, the son could be coming back to ask for more money. Do you ever think of that? He could have been coming to ask for more cash. The father didn't know why the son was returning. Yet he he ran. And the father lavished unconditional love on his son, not because of his position and certainly not because of his performance, but because he was his son. 
No other reason. And what a wonderful, wonderful picture of Father God whose unconditional love for us was that so great that he would send his son to pay the price that we couldn't pay. And he didn't. He did it not knowing if we would come to repentance or not. He did it anyway. He did it for the atheist who never says yes. Such is his love. That's what unconditional means. Without condition. He doesn't love us because we've chosen him. He just loves us. For God so loved the world. It's unconditional. And this story is so good because we see this orphan-hearted son come to his senses. He realizes what he was looking for was at home after all. And he returns and the father is looking for him every day. So easy to read the story and think, well, that was a good coincidence. The father just happened to be kind of, whoa, look. That one moment when it's, no, the father been looking, been seeking, watching, waiting. And when he sees him, he runs. He accepts him just as he is, stinking of pig poop. He was stinking. Muddy, dirty, unwashed, unclean. Now, remember too that the father would have been or would have become ceremonially unclean too by Jewish standards because pigs are unclean. And so in Jewish culture, the father would have been contaminated and made unclean too. Yet, the father still flings his arms around his son and embraced him. What a wonderful picture of the father heart of God. I told you this was all about the father. What a picture. The shame, again, in that culture. He's now contaminated. Culture would have said, stand back from it. But the father runs too. The culture says, dishonor, stand back. The father says, no, honor, come to. And the first thing the father does after loving and hugging his son was to restore him. He places a robe on him. He restores the son's honor and dignity, even though he risked his own shame by doing so. The robe covered the stinking rags that the son was in. That robe covered the evidence of the son's sin. No longer was the son's shame exposed to everyone. He was covered. He was hidden in the father's robe. Remind you of anything? How we are now clothed in his righteousness. When our righteousness was as filthy, stinking rags, his righteousness covers us. And in this story, the robe that the father gave not only covered the son's iniquities so they were hidden, but it demonstrated to everyone around that the son's position as a son was now instantly restored. So first his unrighteousness was hidden and covered, and then he was made righteous. And that's true of us. His position as a son was not downgraded because of his failure. He was still the father's son, and the father honored him because of that, not because of what he'd done. What a wonderful picture that is for us. His righteousness not only covers us, so our unrighteousness isn't exposed, but that restoring makes us righteous. 
So you are not a dirty, filthy sinner that has somehow had an invisibility cloak of righteousness put around you so no one can see what's really underneath. You are made righteous. Yeah. This is what, what, what a father. What a father. His righteousness not only covers our unrighteousness, but it makes us righteous as we are restored to a place as a son. And if that was not restoration enough, then we see the father put a ring on the son's finger. Now again, in that culture, a ring such as that was a symbol of authority. You've all seen those old movies, you know, where, where they melt the wax on the letter and then the king or someone puts their ring onto it. That, that's a sign of authenticity. That's a sign of authority. That's what that ring does. And with that ring, the father gave the son access to all of his wealth. Just think that through. So you've got a son who's now wished you were dead, asked for your money, taken half everything you have. He's gone and squandered it on wild living. He's come back and you've forgiven him. That's okay. And now you've given him the ATM card with the pin. That's what this is. So it's not just what I'll restore you and you can be my son and we'll see, you know, we'll see if you can kind of prove yourself worthy. No. He restores it. That ring would enable the son to act as if the father was present. He could make deals, buy and sell land, set up binding contracts with that ring. He was restored with the father's full authority. So the father didn't just restore the son's dignity, he restored his authority as a son. His authority was not dependent on his performance, but it was dependent on the father's performance. When the son came and said, I have sinned against God or against heaven and against you, the father forgave him. That was the son repenting. The father forgave him and he restored his authority. And so our position as sons and daughters isn't dependent on our performance or our past behavior, our sonship just rests on who our father is. You see, I'm, I'm a son of Peter, my father. I did nothing. He did all the work. I mean, mum was there as well, but... <laughs> I, I, I did nothing to be his son. The Father, my Father, your Father, our Father has done it. Our sonship rests on who our Father is and what He has done. Not on what we do or on our performance. And the next thing we see in this incredible story is that the Father put sandals on the Son's feet. The Son came expecting to walk as a servant. As a slave, which in that culture would have meant no shoes. It was a sign of position and wealth to have shoes. But the, the father puts the sandals of sonship on his feet, allowing him now to not only be restored as a son, but to walk as a son. What an amazing dad. I told you this was all about him. And this brings us to the very last part of our story where the father continues to honour his son by throwing a party. Not satisfied that his son knows that he's restored. He wants everyone to know that his son has been restored. However, the older brother, he sees the party and the restoration of his, 
his younger brother hasn't passed him by and he immediately reacts to the honor that his brother is receiving. He reacts negatively, receiving as the honor, the honor to his brother as dishonor to him. There's an important lesson here. He saw the father's acceptance of his wayward brother as actually rejection of him. Instead of being able to celebrate with his brother who was lost but now found, instead of being able to enter into the joy of the father, the older son rejects not just his returned brother, but he rejects his father. Do you remember the story of the talents? And what does the father or the master say in that story to the servant who's done well? Do you remember? It says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. The servant was able to enter into the joy of the master or the father because he'd done well with what he had been given. What he had been given. You don't read in the story of the talents the, the, the master comparing the one who'd made two talents with the one who made five. They're never compared. He doesn't, well, he's done okay, but he did really well. No, he was only compared to the gifts he'd been given. Because comparison with others and others' gifts will kill you. And when you stand before God, you're never going to be asked to compare yourself with what other people did with what they've been given, you're only ever going to be have to give an account for what you did with what you've been given. And so this son is struggling because he's trying to compare himself to his younger brother and he sees his younger brother having come up short and so he thinks, well, that puts me in a better position. We really come out well when we start comparing ourselves to others. Because it always ends up in one of two things. Justification or disqualification. So we either try and justify ourselves because we think we've done better than the next guy. Or we just disqualify ourselves because we think we can't do as well as the next guy. And that's our orphan heartedness coming out. We're coming up short. And that shows us that we kind of feel like we're only going to get stuff from God, from the Father, if we do better than the next guy. We kind of feel like, well, there's only so much honor available. There's only so much reward available. And so if, if he gets it, then by definition, I'm going to get less. But my father has the cattle on a thousand hills. There is no limit to his resources. So that means that when someone else gets something that I've been praying for, I should be able to celebrate with them because that doesn't mean there's not enough for me now. You know, when you see someone... Wait, do you do that or is it just me? Oh, it's just me. You know, when you're praying, you're praying for a car, you know, you're, you're praying your best prayers, you're living your best life, and then there's somebody who, who kind of, you know, they're not doing so well. They're not following the rules as well as you are. Maybe they're not giving as much as you are. All that kind of stuff. And suddenly they pray for a car and boom. There's the car. Do you celebrate with him? Do you celebrate as though it was your car that you just got? Are you that excited for them? Not that, hmm, well, bless you, brother. God's good. To you. Or you're like, Whoa! If you'd got the car, you'd be like, whoa, check it out, look at my car. You like that? Oh, check it out, look, he's got a car. And this older brother in the story couldn't enter into the joy of his father because he couldn't, he couldn't celebrate the breakthrough of his brother. He couldn't celebrate the fact that he was lost and he's come to his senses and now the father's forgiven him. Ask yourself, how do you react when someone else gets the breakthrough you've been praying for? Our Father's love is unconditional. 
That guy didn't get the car because he deserved it. He got it because he's got a good father. And at that moment in time, that's how father wanted to bless him. Not because he's done anything or is doing anything. But orphans see everything as affecting them. Everything having an impact on them. And that's why I see this story as so incredible and amazing as I look at the wonder of the father heart of God. You know, that son is like, you didn't even give me a goat. And I've, I've done everything right. I've followed the rules. I've done everything right. And the father said, but everything I have is yours. If you wanted a goat, take a goat. See, the reality is, in this story, both sons squandered their inheritance. Both sons. One squandered it because of misuse. And one squandered it because of no use. They both squandered their inheritance. And we all exhibit signs of orphan-heartedness in different ways at different times. And actually... We react in the way we see God or how God sees us. Amen. We often think we need to perform. We've got to achieve to be worthy of a goat. To be worthy of, of anything. We need to perform to earn his approval or his affirmation. And the reality is we all know that salvation is by grace alone. But I do wonder sometimes if once we're saved, we think that we then have to earn everything. It's all grace. It's not because we earn it, it's because he's good. It's because he's good. In this story... It's just Jesus saying, look at my dad. Look at your father. This is the kind of father that we have. He's amazing. He is amazing. And it's not dependent on us. It's all because of him. Amen. Now, I'm going to pray for us in a moment. But I just want to ask... If you don't know God like this, if you've never come to the Father through Jesus, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I just want you to give me a wave because I'd love to introduce you to him because he has got the best dad in the world. Amen. And he could be your dad too. So I'm just going to go around the room. If I see a hand, we'll stop. Okay. Just be remiss of me not to, after that, of not, of not saying something, but I, I just get in a whole, a whole sense of in the Holy Spirit. This thing on comparison, this thing about comparison. I think God's God's meeting with some people right now, and uh, I just want to give a moment for that. If you're kind of feeling maybe a bit discouraged, a bit resentful. Because maybe you see some things that other people are getting that you think you deserve more. I know that's a tough thing to go, yeah, that's me. But we'll get there in a minute. But I, I, I've always found in, in these moments when I can feel the Holy Spirit like I am now and my heart is beating in my chest, is there's a moment of grace. And that moment of grace means that you're going to get something for free that you might have to work a little bit harder for later. And so in a moment, there's this, something else I'm going to do, but I'm going to ask you to put your hand up and jump into that moment of grace. Don't come up to me afterwards and go, oh, that was me, because I'll give you a headbutt. <laughs> no, I won't. I won't. But I'm just saying, this, when there's a moment of grace, that means you don't have to work for it. That's what grace is. So when the Holy Spirit starts moving and there's a moment of grace, my advice, jump in quick. 
But the other side of that, that I, I think in terms of comparison, is what I call the paralysis of comparison. And there's at least someone here who knows that they're holding back because they're fearful of how they might compare to others. And so if either of those things are you, I want you to be really brave and just put your hand up. Because there's a moment of grace. Thank you. Well done. That's so brave. That's awesome. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Wonderful. Are you okay to stand where you are? Would you mind? Are you part of the church here? Okay. That's awesome. I'm just going to ask a couple of my friends to go and stand with you and pray. Kim, would you go and pray with this lovely lady? And anyone else? Because we're family here. And then I'll just pray. Father, I thank you for this incredible lady, this bravery of this woman. And Father, I ask, would you, would you now meet with her in this moment of grace? Lord, would you give to her, Lord God, that amazing, abundant love, Lord God, that we've been talking about, your unconditional love. Thank you. It's not about her performance. It's not about what she has done or has not done, but on what you have done. And so, Father, we, we release a blessing right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm just going to... I'm just going to pray a blessing on you as a church and then, um, then I'll hand back. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your church. Thank you, it's the bride of Christ. Thank you, Lord God, that your church, universal, is an incredible thing. And Father, thank you that, that I've been able to travel thousands of miles and feel at home among your people because they are your people. And so, Father, I want to pray a blessing on this house Lord God, I want to pray a blessing on them. Would you uh, provide for them? Would you give them more than they ask or imagine? I pray, Lord God, that you, uh, this church would never be unable to do what you've put on their heart to do because of lack of resources. I release those resources now in Jesus' name. Lord, that there will never be a moment where they say, we'd love to do this, but we can't because of lack of resources. Yeah. Father, I pray, release all the resources that they need so that your kingdom might come right here on earth as it is in heaven. And I pray this in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Hello, everyone. Thanks for watching this YouTube video. Hope we've already done this, but if not, hit the like, subscribe, ring the bell. We'd love to stay connected with you. This is a great way for out and about to make sure you remain part of what we're doing here at the River Center. There'll be another great video next week. So check it out and hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks.